The purple head sensor has been out there for a few weeks, so it is time for a follow-up with some troubleshooting tips and reports from user applications. Welcome to the IoTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. I received several success stories from users describing how they successfully used the purple head to speed calibrate their locomotives. Most of them made the purple head sensor work out of the box, just like that, or at least after consulting the documentation provided on the myiott.org webpage. This was actually the first time I was able to come up with a more or less complete documentation by the time the sensor became available. Of course, this is something I will try to do more systematically in the future. And with the most recent batch of purple hat PCBs, I have even started to print a QR code on the PCB, so that you can simply point your smartphone to the QR code and then load the relevant instructions from the web page. I plan to do that for every new PCB I'm going to make. A few questions or problems users were running into have been addressed in the comment sections of the purple hat related videos and some users have also asked questions via email. So let me address some of the most frequent hurdles and questions people were running into and show you how to troubleshoot. Besides questions, I have also received a good number of reports, pictures and videos from people who were successfully using their purple hat sensor to speed calibrate entire fleets of locomotives in a fraction of the time it used to take using more traditional methods. And some users even got creative and found ways to use the purple hat sensor in ways I had never imagined. Stay to the end of this video to see two of those examples and subscribe to the IOTT channel and hit the bell icon so you are not going to miss any future videos on that topic. The most frequent problem people were running into is related to preparing the decoder for speed calibration and the Vmin, Vmit and Vmax settings. In a previous video I recommended to set these variables to zero in order to achieve a linear speed behavior of the decoder. Now, as it turns out, these settings do not work for all decoders. In fact, several users reported that with these settings the locomotive would go very slowly, independent of the selected speed step. The solution to the problem is simple if we consider the purpose, which is to make sure the decoder has a linear behavior over the full speed step range so that we can do a meaningful evaluation of the, so to speak, natural speed. What we want to avoid is non-linear behavior as it is caused by too high or too low Vmit settings or a limited maximum speed caused by a low Vmax value. So if your decoder goes to slow speed if Vmit, Vmin and Vmax are at zero or if it does not even allow you to set some of the values to zero, the solution is to set Vmin to 1, Vmit to 128 and Vmax to 255. These settings create the desired linear speed behavior of the decoder and solved the problem for everyone I heard from. Another, although more general problem that came up when installing the purple hat is connecting the IoTT stick with the Wi-Fi network or setting it up so that it provides an access point so that you can connect a browser to it. In general, I have covered the necessary steps back in video number 42 and it is also described in the instructions on the myiott.org webpage. There you also find this diagram that may help you to understand how the web access process of the IoTT stick works. So let's have a quick look at it. As shipped, the IoTT stick is configured to look for a Wi-Fi access point it can connect to, but no access point name is configured. This will cause the stick to create a temporary access point named IoTT stick followed by the MAC address of the stick's ESP32 chip. This makes it very easy to connect using a smartphone and then enter the Wi-Fi credentials of an access point. If no credentials are entered within two minutes, 
The IoTT stick is creating its own access point, so it is possible to connect to the stick with any computer and access the web pages. If no web page is connected, it times out after 3 minutes and Wi-Fi is switched off. It is important to understand that the access point created by the stick to enter Wi-Fi credentials is not the same as the one that is available after timeout or if the stick is even configured to set up its own access point. In the second case, the access point needs a configurable password, which is shown on the stick display. But once connected, you have access to all configuration pages via browser. The AP for Wi-Fi setup does not require a password, but only allows for setting the Wi-Fi credentials. Normally, that is a pretty straightforward process, and with these instructions and the flowchart in mind, it should be no problem to get the stick connected. A third area that can cause problems is the magnets. The distance sensor works based on measuring the rotation angle of the axle, so it depends on the magnetic field of the magnets that are used. With the wrong magnets installed, the sensor might not work and that is the reason why I strongly recommend using the magnets that are shipped as part of the Purple Hat kit. Now, if you choose to replace the magnets, there is one criteria that determines success or failure. And no, it is not the strength of the magnetic field, but the orientation. The magnet needs to be mounted so that the direction of the magnetic field is orthogonal to the axle. As seen here, the sensor sits on top of the axle and uses the C and X axis to measure the field strength. As the magnet rotates, it therefore generates a sine wave in each of the C and X axis sensor with a 90 degree phase shift between the two signals. By analyzing the signal strength of each signal, the rotation angle of the axle can be determined at any position and with high precision. The sensor thereby is capable to automatically adjust if the two signals have different maximum amplitude as it happens if the sensor is in a slight angle to the exact orthogonal position. Now, let's assume you replace the round magnets, for example, with these really nice micro-stick magnets of 3x1x8 mm, which seem like a perfect fit for an HO axle. The magnet is bigger than the round magnet, the bars are easy to install, and with the larger size the magnetic field should be stronger and the sensor should work even better, right? No. Look at the direction of the field. These magnets are polarized north-south along the longitudinal axis, which means the resulting magnetic field flow is parallel to the car axle and the magnets can rotate all day long and the sensor will detect exactly nothing. So, long story short, field strength is important to some degree, what really matters is the field orientation. And just in case you ask yourself, but how does that work if the sensor is mounted upright? Well, in that case, it uses X and Y axis to measure the field and then it works as in the flat position. So, when you select the appropriate mounting option in the configuration dialog, you really tell the sensor what axis to use for the measurement of the magnetic field. These really were the most frequent questions and problems I heard about from users. So, let me finish up with two user videos. The first one is from Pierre Lambert, an N-Scaler in Canada. The video shows part of a calibration run on his layout. Now, that is not much different from what I have shown in previous videos. What is new, however, is the track measuring card he is using. He actually designed and 3D printed car bodies for N and HO scale to perfectly fit on the purple head sensor board. And he kindly uploaded the design files to Thingiverse so that everybody can use them. The link is in the description below. Thank you Pierre for doing this and for sharing your video. So I started to speed match all my locomotives together. And this car is working uh, great. It's swinging a bit at slow speed when it's backing up. That's the slack in the copper. 
but that's normal. So let's see if I can show you the magnet turning inside the hole. Yeah. So we can see the magnet going around with the all effect sensor. So that's great. And we see the scale speed are 20 km an hour right now. And it's going not too fast. So that's what they like with our model train. So they can go at the at the right speed. So here it is, the purple hat in action. It's a really a great product I will recommend you. And if you don't want to modify one of your nice uh, rail car, you can get someone to print you or print yourself this uh, three, uh, 3D uh, flat car. So you can get your uh, your purple hat going. It will, f it will be a lot easier for you. The second video is from Elser Pike, a G-scale modeler from San Diego, California. He is, so to speak, a purple hat power user, as by now I believe he has speed profiled his entire fleet of G-scale locomotives. The first picture I received from him was this one showing his installation of the purple hat on a G-scale flat car. He added a battery pack to it, which fits the connections of the IoT T-stick and at the same time holds the sensor exactly in the right position. The battery pack powers the stick and Elcher has run it 12 hours in a row without interruption and he thinks it could go even twice as long. And after that he became really creative. He actually used the purple hat as measuring cell and created a full-blown test stand around it. He was then so kind and sent me a video showing the calibration cycle for one of his locomotives, the famous Raytheon Railway Crocodile. As you see, the magnet is driven by the locomotive axle using rollers from a test stand. Elcher is using a Zemo MX ULF, which is sort of a low power command station intended for decoder programming. He is using the vice throttle interface via JMRI to send speed commands from the stick to the command station and at the same time the current speed set is shown on the smartphone running vice throttle. The advantage of this setup certainly is that there are no oscillations caused by the coupler when the locomotive is pushing the purple hat car. Here is a picture of the resulting speed curves. As you can see, the curves for forward and backward movement are almost identical. And on this picture is the calculated speed table and trim values that then are programmed into the decoder and another locomotive is calibrated and capable to drive at the known scale speed. Thank you Elcher for sharing this video. And that's it for today. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and it gave you additional information and fresh ideas about how to use the purple head sensor to speed profile your locomotives. If so, please click the like button below to let me know. It's free, keeps me happy and most of all helps to promote the IOTT channel to other model railroaders because YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.